Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. WebEx has been a little confounding for people. I hope it's working for you. Uh, well, you're here, so it is. Um, thank you. Thank you again for joining us. As you know, our topic today is artificial intelligence and crisis decision making, and our speaker is Dr. Eric Lynn Greenberg. Uh, let me get started with just a little bit of context. <clears throat> Excuse me. Two years ago, uh, our center convened a workshop aimed at assessing the strategic effects of artificial intelligence. Uh, one of its central conclusions was slow down, breathe deeply, step back, calm down. Uh, that many, many of the effects that people had been talking about and worrying about that are revolutionary in character are also long-term effects, uh, and we'll have time to think about and shape their, their arrival. In the near term, the effects are less revolutionary than evolutionary. Uh, and those effects that we explored two years ago were of various kinds, some of which may be positive from the perspective of improving the quality of decision-making in crisis by either improving the information available to the decision maker or buying time for decision making. Now, two years ago, these were merely hypotheses or suppositions. Uh, and our discussion reflected the, the near absence of scholarship examining these hypotheses. Uh, but there's been a lot of good work, or at least some good work done on this topic in the interim, and the author of some of that good work is here with us today, uh, Dr. Eric Lynn Greenberg uh, is an assistant professor of political science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His work is focused on the use of survey experiments to assess the impact of artificial intelligence on elite decision making during interstate crises. Uh, he has a, a bachelor's and a master's from MIT, uh, a PhD from Columbia University. His dissertation on this topic was recently recognized by the American Political Science Association as the outstanding dissertation on an international relations topic of the year. Uh, prior to graduate school, he served as an active duty officer in the United States Air Force. Uh, and he continues on uh, reserve duty as a member of the joint staff. <clears throat> Our ground rules today, he's speaking on the record uh, for about uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Then we'll transition to off the record Q&A. If you would at that point like to join the conversation, and I hope you will, uh, please use the chat function to send me a message. Uh, it, should, it should go to either all panelists or, or to me personally, uh, and I'll ensure that we we get everything into the conversation, time permitting. Eric, thank you so much for spending the time to do this. Thank you for your good work in this field. Thanks for getting our conversation started today. Over to you. And you're still muted, so. There you go. Th thanks so much for, for the introduction, Brad, and thank you to, to Brandon and Katie for all of your help in getting this set up. Uh, so what I'll try to do right now is to share my slides, and then we'll, we'll get started. All right. Is everyone seeing the slides? All right. So, as Brad mentioned, uh, the project that I'm presenting today is about artificial intelligence and crisis decision making. And really excited to get your feedback because this is a very early stage project that I'm working on uh, with Michael Horowitz, who is a professor of political science at Penn. And as you'll see, we're very much kind of in the early stages of this research. We just finished up our initial data analysis about a week and a half ago. And this is the first time that we are presenting this paper uh, in public. So really looking forward to your feedback uh, to shape how we move forward with this project. So to set the stage, I wanna take us back to July of this year when Nanmal Chandi, who is the acting director of the Pentagon's Joint AI Center, made a public announcement saying that 
the Jake was going to start focusing much of their planning efforts on essentially joint warfighting operations, and more specifically, uh, something known as joint all domain command and control. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that looks at the military's use of technology. Joint all domain C2 has become very much of a buzzword in the Pentagon. And it's essentially this notion of using AI, advanced sensors, big data to try to guide uh, military operations in a way that makes them more efficient. But what Mike and I realized from our conversations, both with senior military leaders and my participation in unclassified war games, is that many military leaders at the senior level don't really have a consensus opinion on how artificial intelligence is going to shape their decision making. And then even at a more fundamental level, many individuals don't even know what AI is and what AI can do. I think one little anecdote that highlights this few few months ago is speaking with a senior military officer and his solution to an adversary using AI was to launch an airstrike on the adversary's AI. So Mike and I set out on a project that essentially asks what effect will the increased use of AI by both friendly forces, so the United States and our allies, and rival militaries have on national security decision making during interstate crises. And we focus specifically on interstate crises because they're, they lie at this nexus between war and peace. And the decisions that are made during an interstate crisis can either dictate you know, whether a confrontation between two states escalates into a destabilizing war, or if a crisis fizzles out and you return back to the status quo. And then we ask a second related question, which is perhaps more targeted at social scientists and political scientists, and that's how is AI going to affect the perceptions and interpretations of state behavior that underpin decision making? And as I'll talk about in a little bit, this is because much of the literature in international relations focuses on perceptions, right? Decisions are based on the perceptions that leaders have of rivals and allies. So if you bear with me for the next 30 minutes or so, I'll, I'll try to convince you using a series of survey experiments uh, that decision makers view AI controlled events differently than human controlled events. And we'll talk about what those are in just a few minutes. And much of this is driven by a current limited trust uh, and confidence in AI. And, and as Brad mentioned, you know, trust in, in AI is something that's evolving and changing over time. So what we're presenting to you today is really a snapshot of what decision makers are thinking uh, present day. And in these survey experiments, we'll show you that military decision makers are less likely to use force when their own intelligence services provide them with AI delivered information versus information that comes from human analysts. But at the same time, they're more likely to escalate and retaliate following a rival's AI enabled actions versus actions carried out by humans. So we, we think this is an important question that has theoretical and policy implications. Talked a little bit about the theoretical implications dealing with Know, how technology affects perceptions of adversaries and allies, but there's also important policy implications when we think about military planning, crisis decision making. But despite that, there's relatively little research, at least in political science, on how AI is going to affect military decision making during crises. And we think this is because research on emerging technologies typically follows a, a similar trajectory where it starts off with a discussion of military applications of a technology, then you have discussions about ethical debates, then a discussion about security implications. So what does this mean for the balance of power, for alliance dynamics? And then finally, we get to discussion and analysis of what we call these underpinning logics of all of these things, and that's decision-making. And we've seen this with research on, on nuclear weapons, uh, cyber warfare, drones, and we're seeing it again with uh, the development of artificial intelligence. So we see great work by, by folks like uh, Missy Cummings and others that talk about the, the roles that artificial intelligence, in some cases autonomous weapons that are enabled by AI technologies can play on the battlefield. Then we have literature that tells us about the ethical considerations and moral considerations uh, of using AI questions about uh, surveillance or the, the morality of using lawful or lethal autonomous weapon systems. And then there's debates about how this technology shapes interstate relations, some of which has been done by, by folks related with the center. So Andrew Reddy and, and co-authors uh, have authored a study that looks at situational awareness technology and AI and crisis decision-making. Um, and then Mike and I have looked 
kind of at the role of AI in both balance of power considerations and, and alliance decision making. But what we don't see is research that looks at how AI affects the decisions that individual leaders, policymakers make. So what we do is we turn to a broad literature that exists in international relations. And much of this is based on this notion of perceptions and judgments that leaders make about adversaries. And so what we basically argue is that much of IR theory today is underpinned by questions of perceptions. But in all of this literature on perceptions, there's an assumption of human agency. So it's humans that are conducting behavior and taking actions that are perceived. And those perceptions um, are being assessed and judged by human decision makers. And at the end of the day, it's arrivals, intentions, and capabilities that lead to a, a state taking actions or not taking actions against a rival. But what we know from a large body uh, of research from political science and also the policy world is that perceiving arrivals, intentions, and capabilities is often quite difficult, uh, especially during a crisis when you're dealing with essentially the fog of war and confusion. There's massive amounts of information, much of which is unclear. So is an adversary you know, preparing to attack or is their military mobilization simply a defensive measure? And at the same time, rivals have incentives to misrepresent their data, to, to put false information forward because they don't wanna be at a disadvantage or shoot themselves in the foot. And so this results in information asymmetries, which political scientists argue often lead to conflict. And as a result of this, leaders often use cognitive shortcuts to, to try to judge what the adversary is doing. But at the same time, leaders are increasingly turning to technology to assist in the gathering and processing of information. And much of this technology that's been used is essentially narrow AI technology that's being integrated into military services and intelligence apparatus. And so you have things like Project Maven, uh, the DOD's efforts to use artificial intelligence to analyze drone footage. You're seeing AI being integrated into the control systems of autonomous assets that can fly, drive, and sail on their own to collect information or carry out operations. And it's increasingly being built into command and control systems for, for militaries and their national security apparatus. And so we argue that these new technologies have the potential to influence perceptions in two ways. First, leaders are, are making judgments based on information that's presented to them. And currently that information is typically presented to them by an intelligence service with human analysts. And so AI and, and other types of technology can present decision makers with information. It can analyze information and in some cases even choose the information that's presented to decision makers. But at the same time, rivals are also using AI and they're using AI to carry out military operations uh, that can cause harm to the United States and its allies potentially in the future. And so this complicates how leaders perceive the actions that a rival has carried out. Right? It was this a deliberate act or was it an accident? And little is really known about how these influences on perceptions affect assessments and decision making in the national security domain. So let me focus first on friendly AI use. And, and Mike and I make the decision to focus primarily on intelligence use. Right? And so that is AI pro providing decision makers with intelligence information. And we do this because it's a, it's a use of AI that has gained a lot of, of media attention and public attention. Um, in recent years because of efforts like uh, Project Maven. And we argue that the use of AI uh, to generate intelligence and to provide decision makers with information potentially play out in three ways. First off, it could generate no difference. Uh, there's a large body of literature in international relations that tells us that leaders often disregard or selectively interpret information that's provided to them by their intelligence services. So if they do that, perhaps they don't really care whether the information comes from an AI enabled system or from a human analyst. Or they might be less trusting of AI information versus human analyzed information. And this is because humans have long gotten used to intelligence coming from analysts. And we have great anecdotal examples. So the, the current commander of the United States Air Force's Air Combat Command publicly came out a few months ago to say that he's not ready to trust AI produced intelligence uh, for targeting purposes. A third option is that decision makers exercise some type of deference to AI information. And this comes from the logic of automation bias, uh, essentially the, the conditions under which an individual might defer to information that comes from an automated system rather than from human judgment. 
And we see incidents of automation bias in, in cases like autopilot, where you have well-trained pilots deferring to uh, you know, an autopilot system, even when that decision is wrong. And these biases, automation bias, is exacerbated when systems are complex um, and decision-making situations are complex. Mike and I think that uh, the center argument, this less trusting of AI versus human analyzed information is going to be what plays out on the battlefield. And why is this? We don't think that operational level intelligence analysis is vulnerable to automation bias in the same way that something like uh, flying an airplane is. And this is true for, for a few reasons. And most importantly, it's because leaders really haven't been socialized to the use of automated intelligence gathering and, and production systems. Whereas pilots have spent decades learning how to use autopilot and, and using it, uh, that's not the case in the intelligence domain. So this leads us to two testable hypotheses that, that we'll test uh, using our survey experiments. And the first is essentially that national security practitioners are going um, to, to you know, look at the accuracy of information provided by human analysts is greater than that provided by artificial intelligence systems. And then since decision makers are basing their actions in many cases on their perceptions and judgments of information about arrival, the practitioners are going to be more supportive of launching military action when information about threatening activity is provided by human analysts rather than an AI system. But we know that it's not just friends and allies that are developing AI for military applications. Uh, we have open source reporting about Chinese systems uh, that can, you know, aircraft systems that can drop munitions with little human involvement. Russia reportedly tested a, an autonomous armored personnel carrier in Syria a few years ago. And we know from writing by Chinese military scholars that they're very anxious to integrate uh, AI into their command and control systems. So how does arrivals use potentially affect our perceptions uh, of arrival? So as you mentioned earlier, uh, decision makers really judge arrivals motives and goals uh, when they're deciding how to respond to arrival action. And as we mentioned, crises are confusing times. Um, it's, it's very difficult to get full information. So leaders often make these worst case assumptions and are, are subject to what we call sender receiver gaps. So essentially an adversary might take an action and intend one thing, but it's perceived incorrectly by a recipient. And that's even before we have AI enter the picture. And we argue that AI potentially complicates how leaders perceive rivals in a few ways. First, uh, friendly leaders need to distinguish whether an action was carried out by an AI or by you know, human direction. And even if they are able to make that distinction, which might be difficult, does AI directed action reflect a leader's intent or was the AI, AI acting on its own? And we argue that these different types of behaviors might generate different types of emotional reactions. So why do we care about emotions uh, in, a, in a talk and project about technology? Well, we argue that these different types of systems can lead to actions that generate different amounts of anger, perceptions of hostility or intentionality. And political psychologists tell us that these emotional reactions can drive subsequent responses. So for instance, anger is thought to generate more significant retaliatory pressures. And this leads us to this hypothesis, which is essentially all else equal, national security practitioners are going to prefer more severe retaliation following a human directed rival attack than an identical attack directed by AI. And we think this is the case because there's again, some type of human agency involved. So someone to blame uh, for the attack. So how do we go about studying this? So anytime you study a, a new emerging technology, it's, it's challenging for a few reasons. First off, there's limited data on real world military AI use. Much of this you know, technology is, is still in development and hasn't been fielded. And the cases where there has been some real world use, it's typically in demonstration or, or highly classified. And there are some war games, both classified and unclassified, um, that you know, look at the use of AI. And in most cases, war games are, are not structured for comparative analysis. Either something happens or it doesn't happen, right? So you have an attack being carried out by an AI system, which means you confront what we call the fundamental problem of causal inference. You never see this counterfactual situation where that same exact attack uh, was carried out by both an AI and a, and a human directed uh, individual. And then the third challenge is that there's limited historical parallels and analogs. So of course we've had automation in the past, 
but based on discussions with military leaders and practitioners, they seem to view AI as in this fundamentally different class of technologies uh, than past automated systems. So what we do is we use a survey experiment, which is a tool that's increasingly common in international relations research, and it essentially creates that counterfactual condition that we need. And so we present uh, essentially our respondents that I'll talk about in just a minute uh, with identical scenarios, but we vary small details about the scenario. Uh, and we're randomly assigning individuals to those different treatment conditions. And in this particular experiment, we vary whether AI is or is not involved. And so that allows us to, to essentially measure the treatment effect of AI on a decision outcome. And our sample is, we think, pretty unique. It's a 300 national security experts and practitioners uh, that we recruited online. Uh, so it's not necessarily a, a perfectly representative sample of who's sitting in the National Security Council in the Pentagon or the State Department uh, because we're using this online sample. Uh, so it omits many of these senior decision makers, but we still think it's a, it's a useful sample for our hypothesis testing. First, 80% uh, of our sample either has current or, or recent military experience, and then a third uh, has recent or current civilian U.S. government employment. And at the same time, we don't have many senior decision makers. Many of the individuals that we have in our sample are at the rank or pay grade that they would be kind of detailed to the National Security Council as, as directors or working on, on military headquarters staffs where they'd be tasked with providing military recommendations on the use of force. So, and you can see here uh, just a, a small example of, of what kind of a screenshot looks like from that online survey. So let me walk through the, the friendly AI use scenario. And again, this is a case where individuals are being asked whether they want to launch a preemptive strike on a rival state. And we vary the intelligence source. So whether that information is provided by human analysts or what we call a, an AI analysis system. Obviously, we're, we're not perfectly capturing reality here. Uh, in most cases, you'd have a blend of information sources being provided to a principal, but we wanted to maximize uh, the, the internal validity of our sample. And then we asked respondents, how much do you support these military strikes? So let me walk you through uh, the, the scenario in a little bit more detail. So all respondents, all 300 respondents are told that the Secretary of Defense announces that after satellite imagery and intercepted communications are collected, Military intelligence analysts or a military intelligence artificial intelligence system, and that's where we do this randomization. So half of our sample gets a human analysts, and then half are told uh, that the information is provided by an AI system. And we're saying that they assessed with high confidence that a rival state is preparing to attack a U.S. base in the Middle East, and this attack would kill approximately 500 American troops. So the only thing that varies between these two scenarios is who provides the intelligence information. And then again, we provide same information after those manipulations. We say that based on the information, the president announces that he's going to carry out a limited operation to prevent the adversary attack. And because we want to control for as much information as possible, we control for the likelihood uh, that the attack will stop the rival's efforts. We control for the number of U.S. casualties and control for the likelihood of escalation. And then ask respondents whether or not they support strikes in the situation. And so when, what do we find? As a first cut, we find that 72% of respondents who are in the condition where intelligence comes from a human analyst, 72% of those respondents support or strongly support launching the attacks against the rival. Within the AI condition, less than half of respondents support or strongly support the use of military force. But we want to try to unpack that a little bit more. So we, we ask kind of, how much do you trust that the information is correct? And again, you have a far greater proportion of respondents in the human intelligence uh, experimental condition very much are completely trusting that the information is correct relative to 23.8% of those uh, in the AI condition. And for those of you that prefer graphs, you can kind of see the, the effect sizes here are pretty significant, um, both substantively and statistically. And that's on a one to five scale uh, where one is essentially do not trust at all. Five is completely trust. So that gives us a little bit of an understanding of how information is shaping perceptions. But we also want to get a better understanding of what we call the micro foundations of this. So we ask respondents to tell us in a sentence or two why they opposed or supported the proposed operation. 
and we get 300 qualitative responses of a sentence or two, and we categorize them by hand into one of six categories. And we have to be very kind of tentative in, in the findings that we can derive from this because the sample size is relatively small. But I think one thing stands out. Uh, about a quarter of respondents in the AI analysis condition have doubts about the quality or accuracy of the intelligence, uh, whereas a far smaller percentage in the human analysis condition doubt uh, the intelligence analysis. And then unsurprisingly, since these are national security experts, large numbers say they made the decision simply because they needed to protect US forces against a threat. And, and here you can see an example of, of some of the, the statements. Um, essentially, there's a lack of trust and a desire for human review and interpretation uh, before this information can be used for any kind of planning purposes. Uh, so what we find essentially is there's strong support for our first two hypotheses and national security decision makers are currently hesitant to delegate analysis with any kind of significant consequences uh, to machines. So let me pivot now to the other scenario, the second experiment, and this is where the rival is using AI. And in this particular experiment, we have the rival shooting down an unarmed US reconnaissance aircraft, and we vary whether uh, the adversary uses an AI controlled command and control system or a human directed uh, command and control system. And I realize this is asking the respondents maybe to stretch reality a little bit, um, but again, we wanted to maximize the, the internal validity of the experiment. And we also vary whether the incident is described as being accidental or intentional and ask respondents to select what they believe is the most appropriate response uh, from the United States. And I'll walk through the experiment again. Uh, so you can see it here. We, we again say that this is an unarmed aircraft uh, operating in international airspace, uh, 24 crew members. This number comes from the number of crew members that were on board uh, the EP3 uh, that had an incident in China in the early 2000s. And then what we vary is essentially whether the pres rival country's president announces that an air defense officer engaged the aircraft or an artificial intelligence air defense system engaged the aircraft, and whether it was a deliberate event or an accidental event. And then we ask the participants or respondents to pick from a, a list of actions here. And you can see these are along an ordinal scale. Uh, from no action all the way up to an airstrike that destroys the rival's air defense headquarters. Um, what's notable here is that we look at the archival record and look at the historical record, and we see that these are all options that have either been considered or used uh, by the United States in response to shoot downs of reconnaissance aircraft uh, in international airspace. So again, we're trying to, to create as realistic of a scenario as possible. And so these again are, are on a one to seven scale. And so what do we find? So this is interesting to us. When we collapse the treatment conditions and are comparing solely AI command and control to human AI, uh, command and control, we see that the mean preferred level of retaliation on that seven point scale is significantly higher uh, in response to a shoot down that's directed by an AI system uh, than an than attack that's directed by an adversary's human C2 system. But we unpack that a little bit more and look at the accidental and deliberateness of, of the claims. So I think there's three noteworthy findings here. The first is that when the incident is described as deliberate, uh, you can see that the human C2 condition uh, results in slightly higher calls for escalatory responses than the AI situation. And so this is in line with our third hypothesis that uh, you're going to kind of attribute more human agency and blame uh, against uh, the human. The second interesting finding is that respondents are more likely to demand escalation uh, when an incident is described as deliberate versus accidental. And this makes sense to us, but it also provides potential windows for de-escalation in the event of real world conflicts or potentially allows leaders to obfuscate uh, and misrepresent what they were actually trying to do by claiming that something was an accident when it might have been an intentional act. And then the third finding that we think is the most noteworthy is that if you compare the human C2 accident condition um, to the AI C2 uh, accident, um, there's a far higher uh, call for escalatory responses to an AI accident than there is to a human accident. And this suggests that respondents think that machines are somehow less fallible, perhaps, 
uh, than humans and are more willing to carry out large retaliation. So again, we try to unpack these findings. Uh, we ask respondents, how angry does the shoot down make them feel? And we see again uh, that these responses fall essentially in the same order as the escalatory preferences on the previous slide. We then ask respondents, how much hostility does the rival's action demonstrate? And again, we see kind of a similar rank ordering um, to, to the, the call for escalation, which suggests that perhaps it's perceptions of anger and hostility that are driving escalatory responses. What becomes interesting is when we ask respondents about, you know, do they believe the rival state intentionally attacked the US aircraft? One is, is essentially what we code as, no, it wasn't intentional. Two is coded as intentional. Uh, what you see here is the ordering is a little off. And, and this in our mind suggests that people are still unsure uh, of how to attribute blame to a, a rival's AI systems. Uh, they don't really understand what intentionality means or doesn't mean. And this is something we're trying to unpack in, in future iterations of the work and, and would love your thoughts uh, on kind of how to think through these particular findings. And again, we ask a qualitative question uh, that asks respondents to tell us why they chose their desire in response to the shoot down. And again, we need to, to be very cautious in any kind of you know, claims that we can draw from this because of the relatively small sample size. But I think there's two notable findings. The first um, is that the deliberate conditions, um, both the human directed deliberate and AI directed deliberate conditions, lead respondents really to justify their claims by saying, well, we need an action that's going to signal to the adversary that their, their behavior was unacceptable and to deter or punish the rival. Um, and then in, in cases where it's accidental, uh, there's a bit of uncertainty about the rival's actions. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't really shed too much light on kind of AI implications, but what we do find is there's some suggestive evidence in some of the quotes uh, that many respondents explicitly stated that rivals are still responsible for the attacks uh, carried out by their AI-enabled systems, even if they're a mistake. So one military officer responded by saying, militaries don't get a free pass when AI makes a mistake. The rivals still made a conscious choice to keep humans out of the loop, and they should therefore pay the consequences. Um, so again, summarizing those findings, um, they're less likely to use force uh, based on uh, the nation's own AI-delivered information, but more likely to use force following a rival's AI-enabled actions. So what are the implications here? Uh, from a theoretical standpoint, it seems like technology has the ability to influence uh, decision makers' perceptions. And we think this potentially increases the potential for misperception during crises. Uh, that has implications for deterrence, crisis bargaining, and signaling uh, that we hope to explore in greater detail in, in future iterations of the project as we go, go further. And there's also, I think, important policy implications about how to plan for uh, responding to AI equipped rivals. So how do we war game this in a way that trains military leaders to better understand what AI can and cannot do uh, and to so start socializing decision makers on how they should be thinking uh, about AI use? The other thing that might be useful is deconfliction mechanisms, which were quite common during the Cold War for confrontations at sea, uh, accidents. How do we think about that in the AI arena? And Mike Horowitz has done some great work on confidence building measures uh, that was published recently on that. So what are we doing next? Uh, we're currently fielding a second wave of the study on a public sample, and this is through a, a nationally representative sample. Uh, we focus only on the rival AI use experiment. So that is essentially you know, what you do once your plane is shot down. Uh, there's a lot of research that tells us that politicians and decision makers are responsive to public opinion. So we wanna see what the public says about this. Uh, we also need to do some additional theoretical research, uh, questions about blame attribution and automation bias. So questions of how long does it take for automation bias to develop? Uh, and also to get back uh, to the, the emotional considerations that we talked about earlier, how does that affect blame attribution when you're attributing something to a machine rather than a human? We're also looking to, to potentially draw on some historical case studies. We realize again that the historical analogs are imperfect, but we think that there are some lessons that we can draw from looking at past systems. So SAGE, for instance, which was an automated air defense warning system uh, that was used uh, during the Cold War. And then finally, there's a standalone portion to, to this project where we look at elite and public preferences towards various types of AI use, where we ask both members of the elite and the public, uh, you know, essentially, 
whether they think there should be full human control or full automation in a variety of different types of use cases. So I'll, that is all I have uh, for the presentation. I'll, I'll leave kind of these slides up for just a minute for everyone to review the key findings and my contact information uh, is on the right. And thank you again for the opportunity to present my research. And I'm really looking forward uh, to your feedback and comments. Thank you. Eric, thanks to you. That was a great presentation. <laughs>